All right, well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson. I'm president of ITIF. I want to welcome you to our event uh, where we're rolling out a new report on uh, a new, kind, relatively new kind of tax policy called patent boxes. And we have two great discussants here today to discuss the report as well as the whole issue of patent boxes. Uh, we will adjourn at 1030, if not before, and so we should have plenty of time for, for questions uh, from you all. I would also add that we are um, webcasting this, so if folks are listening and uh, would like to submit a question, you can do that with hashtag ITIFBC, and hopefully I'll try to get to it. Uh, so um, let me start by introducing uh, uh, Tracy Fultz, who is the um, uh, life science transfer pricing leader at Ernst & Young. Uh, there probably aren't a lot of those people. That's kind of a, a niche a field that yeah. you're in. Uh, she advises clients in the area of pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device intercompany pricing. She also serves as a broader healthcare thought leader uh, for uh, the global uh, Ernst & Young Organization Pharmaceutical Center, uh, including as an advisor to the top 30 accounts in life sciences globally. Uh, she is also a member of Ernst & Young's LLP Steering Committee on Healthcare Reform for Tax and Healthcare Policy Issues and she received her MPA in healthcare management and policy from New York University and is also a mathematician. But in particular, the reason she's here is she has done an enormous amount of work on patent boxes and looking at them, and in particular, looking at them in the context of whether this is an appropriate policy for the United States. Uh, next is uh, Victor Kramer. Uh, Victor is the financial counselor and head of the financial department at the Royal Netherlands Embassy. Uh, he covers a wide range of financial affairs, including uh, financial market regulation, budget, taxation, and customs. Uh, and between 2001 and 2008, he worked at the Ministry of Finance in The Hague, where his last position was head of unit customs legislation. And before that, he worked on European corporate taxation and international taxation. He's also worked at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and a private consultant on European tech funding programs and he has a master's degree from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, the reason in particular Victor is here, as you will see, is the Netherlands has one of the more interesting uh, tax policies with regard to patent boxes, and I thought it would be very uh, enlightening to have Victor talk about why the Netherlands has done this and what, what they've done. So I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about, and I never know how to do this. There we go. There we go. So I, I put this slide up there because I think we have to look at this issue in the context of why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about expanding corporate tax incentives, particularly at a time when we have a significant budget deficit? And I think the answer is pretty clear if you followed our work over the last couple of years, certainly other people as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, that the U.S. is in a competitiveness and innovation crisis. Uh, we have uh, what that shows is essentially is the rate of innovation on progress, uh, rate of progress on innovation based metrics in a report we did called the Atlantic Century 2. And you can see the U.S. is second last uh, in terms of progress on things like growth of corporate R&D, growth of productivity, growth of new firm formation, expansion in the number of scientists and engineers. Uh, only Italy is, is behind us. Uh, so we really, I think, have significant challenges. Uh, we also see this in manufacturing, where we've lost more manufacturing jobs as a share of our economy than any other OECD nation. Uh, this is a big uh, reason, I would argue, we've had the big, uh, we've had such anemic economic growth even before uh, the Great Recession, but certainly, certainly after. Okay. So. This, I think, it gets point, points to the fact that tax policy uh, is a key in terms of regaining competitiveness, particularly around innovation. In the last decade, what we've seen, uh, even the last two decades, more and more countries recognizing that they're in an intense race for global competitive advantage and as a result are focusing on reducing taxes, overall corporate taxes, and putting in place uh, new incentives. You can see that now uh, the average uh, OECD uh, statutory rate is now below 30 percent. 
uh, the U.S. is around 39% when you include the average state rate. Uh, in 1992, the U.S. R&D credit was the most generous in the world. Today, uh, we're 17th uh, in the OECD. So we really have not kept up. Uh, even when you look at effective tax rates, our effective corporate tax rate, depending upon how you measure it, uh, is uh, certainly in the top quartile. Some would argue it's as high as fourth, fifth, sixth uh, in the world. And that's, you can see that, and that's sort of our tax generosity. Look at countries there uh, like Spain, uh, Mexico, Portugal, France. Okay. So on to this scene where countries now are competing, uh, trying to put in place effective innovation policies, including tax policy, uh, to gain advantage. What we see now is the emergence of this new tool called patent boxes. And essentially what patent boxes do, and there's a few different flavors which we'll talk about, but the core of what a patent box does is it allows a company to take income from patented products or you know, potentially services and have that income be taxed at a lower rate than what average uh, other corporate income is taxed at. Uh, and we see just within the last several years, really within the last maybe five or six years, uh, uh, eight nations, uh, seven of them in Europe, have, uh, have enacted patent box regimes uh, to incentivize firms to uh, patent or produce. There you can see uh, now uh, Belgium, China, uh, France, Ireland being the first, uh, first country to do that a long, long time ago. Uh, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Spain, and Switzerland. And I would add also the UK. Uh, the UK uh, has, made a, has made a commitment that by 2013 their patent box will go into full effect. Uh, what they've done is they will have a 10% corporate tax rate on income from patents. Uh, that is a reduction from their overall rate of, uh, of 28%. And what's interesting, I think, about, um, about what the UK is doing is um, this is a country that faces a budget crisis or a budget problem that's just, if not more severe, certainly as severe as the United States. And in that environment, you have a, essentially a political will to say, we're not going to be able to get out of this problem just by slashing spending. We have to also make investments, and the UK government sees patent boxes as a key investment to regain competitive advantage in the UK and then to begin to grow the economy again. Okay, so this is one way to look at that. If you look at these countries, the first, second column is what the regular corporate tax rate is. First thing you'll see there is it's lower in every country than the United States. Uh, the third column over there is what the patent box rate is. So, for example, in Belgium, uh, you get an 80% deduction, so it basically equals a 6.8% rate. If you're doing patented income in Belgium, uh, you're going to get a tax rate that is significantly lower than the 20% rate that other income is taxed at. Uh, what you can see, see, for example, in the Netherlands, which we'll hear about, 10% rate, uh, Spain, 15, uh, France, 15. Uh, China can even go as low as zero, depending upon the amount of uh, R&D, et cetera. The other last column there is in terms of the differences of what actually qualifies. Uh, some countries have put uh, it mostly or almost exclusively on just patent income. Other countries have expanded the definition of that. In China, uh, it's uh, technical know-how, things that are made if you have a certain number of scientists and engineers, uh, if you if uh, uh, have a certain amount of R&D, you can get this rate. Uh, and the Netherlands, uh, actually, they don't call theirs a patent box. They call it an innovation box because a wide variety of certain types of products uh, that are innovation-based can qualify for this, even if they're not directly related to patents. Okay, so what's the economic theory behind this? Why are we... Why are we saying that there needs to be this tax incentive around patents? Sort of the first question is, don't patents already provide an incentive? Isn't that the idea behind patents, to give companies uh, a temporary monopoly so that they can gain uh, rewards? And I think there's really two main reasons to talk about this. One is market failures. The other is globally competitive tax codes. Uh, 
With market failures, I think the key point there is that there's pretty clear evidence by economists that there are significant spillovers from innovation. Uh, companies don't capture anywhere near that. Uh, and even with R&D tax credits, uh, they don't come anywhere close to matching what the externality is in most cases. Uh, the, R the spillovers in R&D are oftentimes 100%. In other words, what the company gets, society gets another 100% on top of it. Uh, because of that, companies systemically underinvest in research and development, which includes patenting. The other is risk. So you take a company like Apple, which uh, has a lot of patents on the iPad. Um, there are, if you went to the Consumer Electronics Show this year, you would see there were 20, 30 companies that are developing similar types of products. So the patent itself did not protect Apple uh, in terms of somehow being the only one that could make an iPad. So they're facing risk. Now, they happen to have a great product with a great app store that gives them a, a lead there. But the lead for Apple isn't coming so much from patents as it is coming from the other kinds of things they do. So there's a lot of risk involved with innovation. And a patent box essentially lowers risk. And therefore, in theory, should lead to companies doing more research and commercialization. I think that's really the key factor here. The R&D credit, which most of these countries have, focuses really on the inputs, whereas the patent box is saying we want to reduce the risk of commercialization and taking it to market. The last point, or the second point, is about globally competitive tax codes. There's a big difference among economists on this point, but I think there are uh, some economists uh, would encourage you to look at the mirrorless review that was done over in the Institute of Fiscal Policy Studies in the UK. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, a very thorough review of UK tax policy. And one of the points they make is that uh, it can be rational tax policy to tax mobile activities at a lower rate than immobile activities. Now, what does that mean? That, that essentially means um, think tanks are immobile, so we don't pay taxes. But if we pay taxes, you could tax us a lot and we're not going to move. We're not going to go and reestablish in the Netherlands. Uh, we're here. Uh, grocery stores are immobile. Uh, barber shops, uh, retail stores. But semiconductor factories are not. Uh, biotechnology companies are not. Uh, machine tools are not. So there's a whole set of traded sectors, if you will, software is not, that essentially could be anywhere in the world and now are increasingly anywhere in the world. And so what the patent box does is it essentially lowers taxes on mobile activities to make them more competitive, to make the country with them more competitive to be able to attract them. Okay. So, at the end of the day, are these effective? What have they done? How, how, how what has been the result in terms of promoting innovation and, and importantly jobs in these countries? And I wish I could say we know the answer. We don't, unfortunately, in large part because the experience of these uh, is just too new. Uh, they've been put in place in most cases just in the last few years. And the last few years are not exactly sort of a standard normal time to measure anything given the volatility in the global economy and the changes and the ups and downs that's happened. So limited data make evaluation difficult. However, there has been at least one study, this is by uh, folks over at the Institute of Fiscal Studies in the UK, Rachel Griffith, Helen Miller, and Martin O'Connell. We cite that study in the report if you want to look at it, there's a URL. And what they find, uh, they modeled uh, this through three countries, even though some other countries have it, Be Netherland, Belgium, Luxembourg. And what they found is that patent boxes, the presence of a patent box does lead to countries getting more patent income in the countries. Uh, and as you can see, it leads to a little bit less in all of these other countries as companies move patent income to other countries with, uh, with the more generous regime. So the real question then is, um, what, do you, what does that do to both tax revenues and jobs? Now, what they find in terms of tax revenues is that this is not, uh, at least in the short term, and they only model the short term. They don't model the long term in terms of if more patents were there, more production, 
uh, there'd be higher wage jobs, there'd be greater economic growth. So they don't model that. They just say very short-term static modeling. What they find is there's no Laffer curve, if you will, here. Uh, the countries, even though the Netherlands, Belgium, and, and Luxembourg get a lot more patent income, they're taxing it at a lower rate. So their overall income from corporate taxes around this particular area go down. Uh, but even other countries now go down also because they're getting less patent income, even though their rate is the same. But again, I stress that's just a short-term static analysis. It's not a dynamic analysis, which they didn't do. Um, and the last part would be um, whether uh, these have an effect on jobs. I didn't put this in, or are there types of measures? There's a table in there, very, very sort of cursory correlation suggests that patent box countries have better performance on certain things like the, uh, obviously the number of patents, but uh, things like venture capital and some other things. Now the problem with that is there's a, uh, there, there's a whole issue of do, do countries put in place patent boxes because they're not performing well. Uh, the countries that are performing well don't need them, and so it's really hard to, get to, to, uh, to determine causality with, with a lot of these things. But I think one of the key things, though, which comes out when you do this research is the nature of the patent box regime itself in Europe, where uh, all of the patent boxes are, with the exception of China. Now, what Europe does uh, is that they, I would argue, have a pretty significant design limitation in how their patent boxes are set up. What they essentially do is they say, you can get the patent box tax incentive even if you don't do your R&D in our country and even if you don't produce the product in our country. Now, one of the problems with that is that it can lead to just corporate income shifting. So you move over your patent income to this country and you can tax it at a lower rate. Now, even with that, and Victor maybe can talk about this issue, even with that, uh, I would argue limitation. Uh, a lot of European countries still believe that this is very valuable for their overall innovation system. And I'm not denying that. I don't say it's not valuable. I'm saying it would be more valuable if that restriction were not there. Now, why is that restriction there? That restriction is there by because of a European Commission ruling about unfair, uh, distortive competition. So they don't want European countries in this race to the bottom competing with each other to sort of take investment from one place and put it in another. Now, I understand that as a theory. But I think applying it in this particular case is, is frankly short-sighted and, and ill-advised. And here's the reason why. There are three main reasons. If you really want to have a level playing field for investment in Europe, the first place to start would be to force Ireland to raise their corporate tax rate. So Ireland has a 10% corporate tax rate. Why is that not distortive? If this stuff is distortive, why is the differential differentiation and or you go to Estonia, they have a low corporate tax rate. Why is corporate tax rates differential allowed in Europe? Patent boxes are not. Uh, to me, there's no logic behind that. You either do one or you do both. And I'm not arguing you do, you do that. I'm just saying they should be applied equally. The second is, uh, I get the notion that you don't want to have sort of a race to the bottom and just, in, you know, just sort of um, hand out cash so that a company moves from Germany to Spain. That's bad. Uh, we should do that in the U.S. and we don't. So I get that. But that's not what patent boxes are really about. Patent boxes are about an incentive that drives growth and innovation. And tying it to production and, um, and, and R&D, I would argue, is pro-growth. It's not zero sum or even negative sum. The last point, I think, why Europe misses this, uh, why how they miss this is, this would be fine for Europe if there was no global competition, if, if, if you know, all the European companies were like, okay, we're going to do this within Europe. The reality is, though, there's global competition, and Europe is missing out because of this regime. And so American companies, Canadian companies, Japanese companies can do their production in the U.S., Japan, or Canada. They can do their R&D there. Then they can move their patent income to Europe. Europe doesn't get the full benefit. So in a global economy, I would argue, this kind of European restriction doesn't make uh, sense. And the the patent box policy could be more effective if it were redesigned there. And the Chinese don't have that. And the Chinese, it's like you want to you want to you want to get the incentive. You've got to actually do the R and D in production in China. So that let me just finish up by saying, 
There's at least three or four main issues in how the U.S. should go about designing a patent box. Let me just say, first of all, I think we should have a patent box in the U.S. I, I think after doing this research and looking at the overall global situation, I think a patent box would be a very important tool for the U.S. to become more competitive, uh, particularly in innovation-based activities. So the first issue is the rate. Uh, I think what we say in the paper is uh, the rate should be something significant as an incentive. What that rate is, we don't really say. It could be anywhere, I would sort of say, between 10 and 17.5%. 17.5% is half of the statutory rate, but that's still higher than what a lot of other of these patent box countries do. 10% is more in the competitive ballpark of what these countries do. So something along those lines, somewhere in that range, I think, uh, we need to be talking about in terms of a significant incentive. Uh, the, second, the second is uh, eligible activity. And I think there, um, what, we are, what we propose in the paper, at least at this point, is basically eligible activity is income from patents. Uh, again, that could be broadened, but there's an issue, again, of sort of fiscal... Uh, uh, how much fiscal headroom there is on this patent. Limiting it to patents is simpler, I think, and direct. The third area is whether there should be a link to production and R&D. I think there should be. I think also politically and frankly, in my view, be very heavy lift uh, to do this without some kind of link to domestic production and R&D. So the question really then is how do you design that? On the most extreme case, you could say you don't get anything unless you do all your R&D and all your production here. I, I don't think that's realistic, uh, given the nature of global R&D and production supply chains. What we end up more mostly proposing is uh, something akin to the amount you would the, the amount of. Uh, so let's say you have a product and you and you have an income stream from it. Uh, you, the, the share of that income stream that qualifies for the patent box would be real, would be the same as the share of how much R and D and production you're doing in the U.S. So if you're doing most of your production in R and D in the U.S., most of the income would get this lower rate. If you're doing say 10% of it in the U.S., 10% of the income would get the lower rate. Um, but again, there's different. There's a few different ways to think about designing that nexus between the incentive and the, uh, the, the tax, the lower tax rate and the incentive for production uh, and R&D domestically. Uh, and the last is a more narrow point, but uh, income from patents under review. A number of countries allow uh, the incentive to be given for uh, products that are under review, uh, given the fact that our patent uh, office hopefully will be getting better now that the, in theory, have ended fee diversion. Uh, from the PTO, uh, so patent pendency rates hopefully will come down in some decade from now. Uh, but they're still pretty high, and so the idea there would be rather than force companies to wait a long time before the patent is issued, they would be able to take this rate. Um, so, in conclusion, I think the United States would, would benefit from an appropriately designed patent box. I think it would help uh, do several things. I think it would increase the amount of high-tech production in the U.S. Uh, and by the way, I, when I say that, I think it's important to know that's not just things like semiconductors or uh, drugs or things like that. There's a lot of, uh, if you will, sort of traditional manufacturing that is related to patents, certainly chemicals, uh, some things in transportation. Uh, and so I think it would be a broad-based incentive, uh, certainly within manufacturing and technology, that would lead to more jobs, more production, and a lower trade deficit. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Tracy and um, sort of do it from here. From here. Thank you. Sure. I think just a, a couple big picture comments on all of this. It's important to know that all of those countries who have already implemented, usually implemented in combination with larger tax reform. I think the much bigger things going on in their countries at the time around tax reform. So. Again, very relevant for us today in the U.S. I think the second thing is they also um, were driven by some very large corporations and discussions, proactive discussions with the governments around their potential exit from those countries. And in particular, you can look at the U.K. situation where 
their kind of CFC reform and this patent box regime that has now come into play is really on the legs of several large corporations actually exiting the UK. And so we've seen that, of course, in the U.S. around um, the acquisitions of our U.S. companies by foreign um, corporations. And so it's not like we're not in that situation as well. And I think that many companies have been very vocal about the situation with where our tax rate is now and what that means for them doing business in the U.S. So I think very similar circumstances around the potential of companies exiting the U.S., similar to what these countries faced when they came to the table with this type of an incentive. I think they were very, those countries were very focused on we want to keep the innovation, we want to keep the know-how, we want to keep the strategic thinking, thinkers, we want the blue sky and we need that for our universities. I think very similar discussions here, um, even around education policy, right? <laughs> so not even, you know, in the patent box regime. So I think, again, another similarity as to what was going on in those countries that made this policy come to be. I think from that perspective, that puts a little flavor on something that you had mentioned, Rob, around, you know, why do they let some of the innovation go outside of the country and why don't we have a parameter around all innovation has to stay. I think there was recognition by all the countries that practically sometimes you just need scientists on the ground in local countries. If you're in China and you have to do clinical trials in China, you need to have some scientists on the ground in China. You don't need everyone on the ground in China and you certainly don't need your strategic thinkers there and you don't need the know-how there. And so what um, they're trying to balance the EU restriction and not cross, you know, cannibalize each other, but they're also trying to manage just the practical implication of cor corporations needing to have some jobs on the ground, but trying to retain the thought leaders in the country and what that means for innovation. And so I think that's an important point for people to understand, and I know that, you know, plays into the Netherlands a little bit as well because they have a similar... Um, policy on that. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, Victor? Or... Yeah. Did I... Okay. Okay. So I think the other thing that I would just point out is the spillover impact that you talked about. Um, obviously, when these regimes were released, all of the countries pub published some type of equivalent of a score, right? And in every single one of those um, papers was the implication of what the spillover impact was going to be as far as technology and retaining the jobs and continuing to have that knowledge, um, the blue sky knowledge in particular in the country. And so the, the impact of spillover here cannot be ignored as well. It was key in every one of these and it's it's its own section in the UK consultation document that's out on that regime as well. So I think those are kind of the big picture points that people should realize. I think the other thing is these do these regimes do come into play. We often see it in acquisitions with um, multinational companies where um, they've acquired a company that's in that's in a country that has this type of regime, and many times those jobs or new jobs resulting from that acquisition stay in those countries because they have this type of regime. And I think it's important to know that um, it can also serve as a retention of jobs as well as a creator of jobs. Um, and I think finally everybody noticed that the day the UK regime was um, put out to public that GSK announced that they were actually bringing back a manufacturing plant into the country with thousands of jobs, and so that's a public announcement that's out there. There was no direct link to the patent box for the reason that Rob, you know, had cited before around the EU restrictions, but there certainly was the article around the patent box regime and the announcement that they were going to build a new biopharma plant there. And, at, you know, it was very public that GSK was instrumental in coming to the table with the government to get this regime up and running. So. Thank you, Tracy. Great. Yep. Victor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob and Tracy, for uh, the comments. I was thinking um, that I was, uh, uh, years ago, I was at a conference um, um, presenting incentive, tax incentives on renewable energy. I had a paper that I presented there, and 
um, than I learned during the conference that every single um, measure we, we put in place already was done in the US at a larger scale and better thought through than we did. So I'm very happy that we now finally have a measure that you don't have. Um, but I'm not sure if it's better thought through than you have. Uh, but maybe I can talk a little bit on the, on the, um, um, on the experience we had. Um, because as you pointed out, there are several arguments why you should, why you could introduce an innovation box as 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 as, uh, as we did, and and um, uh, a little bit of background on the on the Netherlands. It's a it's a relatively small open economy. It's the 16th economy in the in the world. It's a um, it's a trade based nation. So um, we're in, um, we're the second largest exporter of agricultural foods, but we're ranked seventh, I think, on 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 trade. Um, we have not as big of a of a domestic market, so we sixty percent of our GDP we earn outside our country. Um, so we're very mindful on um, uh, on competition, uh, uh, global competitiveness, um, and the arguments you put forward to introduce such an argument is market failure, it's spillover effects, it's um, it's peer pressure from other uh, countries, and I, I I heard you say um, uh, the political will, and I think. Uh, the political will in our uh, country, as, as Tracy pointed out, it's part of a, a larger, um, it's been part of a larger um, uh, discussion on tax reform, but a political will to think, okay, we are a small open economy, we need our R&D uh, companies because we think that we will be competitive only if we have the high end and the high skilled um, companies in our, in our country. Um, um, so that, that has been a, a, a major push and we started thinking about innovation policy I think in the late 80s and the market failures we came up with um, is that we're very much uh, a banking, uh, rely, relying on the banking uh, for uh, financing of innovation which means we as opposed to uh, venture capital and, um, and um, uh, private equity which made, makes it a, Pretty expensive to to finance innovation, uh, so we came up with several measures. In 1994, we had a tax credit on the payroll taxes to to get uh, R&D staff um, uh, get a make it more attractive to to hire uh, R&D staff. Um, we had some funding schemes. I can say we're now in the um, process of trying to get a. Um, general uh, tax credit on um, in our tax system on uh, uh, investments uh, R&D investments uh, so that will be in our corporate income tax um, so then you have that's that those are um, credits we have on the input side of innovation so that's um, uh, on both labor and uh, and investments and then um, we saw as a market failure um, we have the Netherlands has a as a, a fairly good ratio of patents compared to invested dollars in R&D but not we think not as good as commercializing uh, those those patents so that's um, as has been a, a major um, argument for introducing um, an innovation box um, as it is right now it's pretty straightforward it's um, um, it's, it's even better than on the pictures it's a, a, at a rate of five percent um, uh, against um, our corporate uh, uh, tax rate is 25.5 percent so there's a 20 percent 20.5 percent difference um, it's on self-developed R&D that may be patents or um, certified R&D it's not on logos and trademarks it's something you can see in some other countries uh, we try to keep it technology based um, um, it's um, uh, um, so with the, and it's not only uh, patents, but it's also, as you mentioned in your presentations, a pending patent requests as well as it takes some time for a patent to come into effect. Um, and that's also um, um, then um, uh, comes into uh, to the discussion on the effectiveness. We tried the other things. We had a rate of ten percent when we started out. We had a very narrow definition of. Uh, of, um, of eligible um, uh, uh, intellectual property, so it was only patents, it was capped. Um, I think the maximum amount of um, um, uh, profits that you could bring in was 400,000 euros. Um, so we, and then we saw that that didn't work as good as we hoped it would. Um, 
So we took away the restrictions, uh, took away the caps, the financial caps. We took away, the, we, we broadened the scope of the um, of the uh, um, uh, the eligible uh, intellectual property, uh, and we lowered the rate uh, to to five percent. Uh, so those are the, 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 the main features. We think um, the combination of a tax credit on, on labor and, and, and a tax incentive on the investment side combined with the innovation box gives us a, a good advantage um, to keep um, R&D companies in and, and attract uh, even more R&D companies. Uh, maybe a little bit on the European discussion, um, as you mentioned it. Um, I know that uh, European um, uh, it doesn't always come across as the most logical way of, uh, of thinking, but it is a logic. Um, and it's the restrictions <clears throat> that are put forward by the European Union um, are restrictions within Europe. Um, so there's on the one hand, you're not allowed to, uh, to uh, give your own companies more than any other company in, the, in, in, in Europe. And on the other hand, you're not allowed to uh, compete for uh, taxes um, um, without getting your own uh, companies the same uh, uh, advantages. But that's within Europe. I mean, if we could restrict um, uh, R&D to, um, to um, uh, developments within Europe, then that would be fine. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's, we, we, as the Netherlands, as I said, we're an open economy. Um, we don't have that much room to, um, to restrict ourselves. If we would do that, then um, uh, I think we narrow our markets uh, more than, than necessary. Um, and also, uh, uh, we don't link our innovation box to uh, production for the same reason. If we would do that, um, and we would have to produce everything that we patented in our own country, that's simply we don't have the production capacity, and nor do we think that's, that's the, um, uh, that we want all the industries that we that we uh, that we uh, uh, work our intellectual property on. So that's um, some of uh, some of the com comments. Uh, I'll leave it at. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, those were both great comments, and um, I kind of feel like Victor. We shouldn't have had you on the panel because if there are any companies in the room that are going to go back to their corporate headquarters and say move to Netherlands. That's <laughs> it's such a great deal. Uh, such a strong accomplished exactly <laughs> such a strong set of incentives. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, uh, maybe Tracy, but but maybe both of you. Um, Tracy, you made a comment about this sometime, some of these countries have done this in the context of overall tax reform, and certainly corporate tax reform seems to be, uh, we seem to be gearing up for it, probably in 2013, sort of getting ready for it, and there's a sort of very, very uh, strong emerging, but I would argue incorrect consensus that corporate tax reform is essentially what's called broaden the base and lower the rate. Some have even gone so far as to argue we should eliminate the R&D credit and use that to get rate reduction. Uh, I would argue that that's, um, we should get rate reduction by lowering the rate, um, not by getting rid of these other kinds of things. There's, then you, what have you accomplished? Uh, actually, you might be worse off. But anyway, um, how, do you, how do you see the nexus between the patent box and uh, overall corporate tax reform? Yeah, well, I think you're exactly right that if you lower the rate by taking away some of the deductions and you really haven't given up anything and you haven't really leveled the playing field, right? So I think part of this is even with tax reform and with the patent box, it's a combination of factors moving around. It's the pieces of the puzzle and how they fit to what is the end all rate that people are being taxed at, right? How you get there and how you move the pieces around is a very complicated puzzle as most of us have begun to learn, right? So I think the UK is a really good example, right? Because they started out with territorial or something that looked like territorial. They had in there a clause that was very similar to what's being thrown around now, which is excess returns. Um, and then they had the patent box in there because they had realized the excess returns um, the, the excess returns clause was going to be very damaging to job creation in their country. And so Can ultimately, explain what that means for sure. So for people who don't know what that is, there's um, several proposals out there now around excess returns 
And if a, if a U.S. multinational is earning income in a low tax jurisdiction or a jurisdiction that has a tax spread of X amount, depending on the proposal, compared to the U.S., if the profits are over a certain amount, then they would come back to the U.S. and wouldn't be eligible for tax deferral. So they would automatically get taxed at the 38% rate now instead of whatever they get taxed at overseas. And so that causes particularly, um, it's particularly troublesome because what it does is it encourages new job creation to be elsewhere outside the U.S. because the, the profits, the transfer pricing is um, the fundamental way in, in which the pricing is determined and you have to have substance to get the right transfer pricing. So it's, you know, it's a very tax techy kind of thing, but in the end they found it to be very damaging and um, they removed it from their proposals and they put in the patent box and set in, in place of that to encourage R&D production in the country versus discouraging it. And so I think for everybody, it's just, okay, if this is what you're going to do with tax reform, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, what are, do we want to encourage R&D jobs? Do we want to encourage just overall corporate activity? What are we trying to accomplish? Because I think until we have that direction as a country as to what we're trying to accomplish, it's going to be hard to say what way should the puzzle come together. And I think that's the reality of the situation. Victor, you want to add to that? Yeah, a little bit. We had um, uh, the same discussion in, in uh, starting in 2004-05 on, on lowering uh, the rates and broadening the base. And actually, this is an outcome. We, what we, in the end, did was getting rid of the specific incentives we had in our tax code and replaced it with the generic um, incentives we have now. So you have an innovation box, you have the um, um, and maybe the, the, the tax credit in corporate income tax. So those are broad technology incentives, but they're not picking any sector, they're not picking on any specific interest. It's a broad idea of, of, um, of um, uh, helping uh, R&D get or, or uh, fostering R&D within your uh, tax system. And that's um, uh, it, and it's hard to lower uh, your rates and broaden the base. It gets, I mean, to get a few points off, it's you really have to take out a lot of specific interests, and, and they all have very, and that's not only in the U.S., but in any country, they have hard lobby groups to, to keep them in. So that's, that's, that's hard. But actually, the, our innovation policy was part of our broadening the base um, uh, and lowering the rates. Can we hire you as a tax advisor for the U.S.? <laughs> because it seems to me that's just to me very obvious that that's the that's what simplification is. It's not it's simplification to me, and, and 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 I think I mean I think one of the interesting things about this debate is that is I would argue that sort of business people like Tracy, I would put you in the business camp, uh, thinking about how do businesses make real decisions. Uh, and, and innovation folks think about innovation, uh, like maybe Victor and me, uh, tend to have a different view of patent boxes. Whereas economists tend to look at the world as we don't want the government to have any influence on anything in the economy. Uh, so therefore, taxes should be just one rate for everything. That's the end of the story. And I think to me, what Victor, what you said is that there's sort of this middle ground where you might you know, reduce some of these very specific things, but have a generalized kind of set of incentives around generalized kinds of activities that you want. Yes, and as an argument to, we didn't, so we didn't go to the European Commission on this, asking if this is, would be state aid, because it's not as it is a gener generic measure within our system. So that's the, that, that sort of proves that. Great, great. So uh, let me open it up for if you are comments or questions, if you can uh, raise your hand and identify yourself. And then, you know, so I'll just, I'm going to take him in order. I see him. So right here, sir. Uh, my name is Philip Piniello with the British Embassy. Uh, I just have a quick comment and then a question. I'm glad that you mentioned the UK and its patent box regime. Um, it was actually initially announced a little bit earlier under the 
previous government. And we had hosted an event in Chicago for the, the then very new Office for Life Sciences, which was created to create dialogue between companies like GSK and the government because of previous fallout over the prescription pricing scheme and other um, uh, the other things in the UK that had happened that had, that had threatened investment to leave the country. Um, during that roadshow event, the patent box was mentioned, and I have to say, um, in my observation, a lot of US companies are here peaked up. I think there's definitely a demand there among US-based <coughs> companies to see something like that, to, to incentivize them. Um, and I think that they made them look, I, I think an important aspect of it is they made them look at the UK in a different way than they had previously. And, and it is actually a very innovative economy. It's always been a very innovative economy, but a lot of people still don't see it that way. My question um, pertains to comparison of tax rates and the loss of competitiveness. You see, um, you know, to what extent have you taken into account, for instance, high income taxes? For instance, Belgium has the highest income taxes, even though it only has a corporate tax of 20%. As far as I, I understand, it's some of the highest income taxes in mainland Europe. And to what extent do you take into effect, uh, into account the effective tax rate? So even though the U.S. is very high, 39%, what are those companies actually paying? And you know, what effect does that actually have on competitiveness? Is your question on Belgium, the personal side, is that what you're saying? Or personal income taxes. Pardon me? Personal income taxes. Personal income taxes. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I don't know the personal income tax rate um, offhand in Belgium, to be honest. So I guess we could get back to you on that. I think the reality is you have hit on the fact that all of this interplays with each other, right? And so, um, but I think generally Belgium, actually, their patent box regime, the benefit is calculated on gross income, which is a little different than most of the other regimes, which is cal calculated on net income, actually. And so within all of the regimes, there is this trade-off among the various different attributes. What qualifies, what, what the, how the qualifying income is calculated, what date you can start to take the benefit, how the benefit is phased in. Uh, there's various different variables even within the regimes that are played off to get benefit. And then, of course, there's the overlay of what's going on in the broader system, either within corporate, the corporate tax system, or the trade-off with the personal income tax system. And I just don't know enough um, about Belgium tax law to tell you. Well, I was using Belgium as an example, but just overall, you know, taking all those into... I think in general, when you look at the economic literature, the tax literature on this, what they essentially say is, if you think about sort of three kinds of taxes, one on uh, corporate taxes, uh, in personal income taxes, and then sort of uh, consumption taxes. Consumption taxes have the least amount of distortion in terms of where things happen. Uh, income taxes don't really have a lot, but they have some, and corporate taxes have the most. So to use the example, if, uh, if uh, the Netherlands has a 0% income tax, I'm not moving to the Netherlands. It's actually a very nice place, but I live here. Now, on the other hand, if they have a 5% tax on income, patent income, I guarantee you there are going to be corporations that move there because corporations fundamentally are mobile. And I think that's what we have missed in this debate on, on taxes is that, frankly, individual taxes, I wrote a book on this a couple of years ago, uh, and it's incredibly controversial, I get that, and incredibly partisan. But from my review of the literature, uh, you know, is it which is better to do, reduce the 39% high personal rate or the 35% corporate rate? <clears throat> I think the evidence that going from 39 to 35 on the personal rate has virtually no effect on anything. Uh, going from 35 to 30 or, you know, through the patent box or other ways would have a big effect. It would, it would have an effect on investment and it would have an effect on location of investment. Uh, the other way to think about this, too, is one of the things that the Europeans have done, I think, better than we do is, and Victor, maybe you can talk to this, they raise a larger share of their national tax income on uh, value-added and consumption taxes than we do, and that gives them the headroom to have a lower tax on mobile activities like uh, corporate R&D and patents and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. We, I think 
the numbers I think we have 40 to 60 percent 40 percent is consumption tax 60 percent is income tax so you have a 40 percent um, uh, that's VAT and excise um, and VAT VAT there's a lot of discussion on whether it's a um, um, whether it's a, a it, it can work anywhere, but it works in the in the in the EU, and we um, it's it's one of the biggest single money makers in in our tax um, system without distorting uh, much of the uh, of the economy. So it's a it's a, a very <coughs> good and solid. It's a, actually we're we're thinking of bringing more into the um, as it is a discussion between mobile and immobile. Um, 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 Actors than than the consumption tax taxes in mobile goods. So that's as a broad base, we think of shifting more to immobile, so to the consumption tax, and moving away more from the uh, from the uh, um, income taxes. Although that's a, I mean, it's not an easy process to. It's a low longer term. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to go in the order I saw them. So yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> James Sang, uh, IBM Mer Research Emeritus. Could you say a few words about how products are qual products or income is qualified for this patent box? In particular, I think it'd be pretty easy to game. I can imagine, you know, uh, I have this 200-pound pig and that has no IP on it, and I have uh, lipsticks that has a patent on it, and I put it on, and then I'll say, is that the whole thing? Is that the case, or is there ways of avoiding getting around, of preventing that from happening? Either one of you. Um, do you want to go specifically to the? Yeah, so some. Um, so first, it need is the patent, and then the second. Um, so that that's that's proof, um, and then as I said, we we use a, a measure of qualified R and D. There are several uh, schemes in the Netherlands that use a, a qualification where you as a uh, as a as a tax um, as the tax administration qualifies certain activities <coughs> as R and D. So that's a there's a, a process there in place. Uh, there are several. Um, um, uh, the system in the Netherlands with the tax administration is such that you can um, call them up and say, well, this is what I'm planning to do. Would you would that qualify? And then you have to obviously fill in. Uh, some paperwork, but then they will tell you if it qualifies or not, and uh, that's that's basically the um, the way of of avoiding. Um, it's not that you can think of anything um, and put it in as a as a R and D result. I mean, it's still R and D, but just a tiny fraction of the, of the cost of the product. And how you do you have a number for what we have? You have to make uh, you have to make a case that at least thirty percent of your profits um, are derived from those um, uh, R and D results. You want to add to yeah, that? so I, obviously every country has different um, standards for patenting. So, you know, this came up in most of the patent boxes. There, each one will say a patent registered in that country typically, or, and it depends on if you're in an innovation box, and obviously you're dealing with we have this know how or this type of process. And people do go out and actually look and say, yes, you know, we've looked at it and it is actually unique and novel and all that stuff. So, there's just a first kind of gut check. Does it does it qualify as a patent? Is it really a know-how? Is it trade secret depending? But then there's also the calculation of how much income is associated with that particular patent process or innovation. And so that obviously is a slice of the pie. It's not, you know, all of the product innovation or income does not qualify in the patent box. There is part of the product income that is taxed at the regular rate, right? So companies are typically doing sales activities, marketing activities, distribution activities in the countries, and the profits related to those activities actually get taxed at the full statutory rate. And so it's usually only a slice of the income that's associated with the patent that qualifies in the patent box. Every country is different on how that calculation works, and that's kind of the point I was trying to make, that each country is moving these different levers around to get to what's the qualifying base, and then how much of the base is, are, is gonna qualify for the incentive, right? So some countries have chosen to take a broad definition, but then take a slice of that as only you can take a piece of that to actually get taxed at the lower rate, other countries have said we're going to make a narrow definition of what qualifies to begin with, but we're going to let you 
but we're going to be generous about how much actually gets the lower rate at that point. Uh, right here. Um, Caitlin Donovan, Get Heart Group, uh, downstairs. Um, thank you for putting this on, first of all, because a week ago I'd never heard of patent boxes, so thank you. This has been really helpful. Um, I was wondering what, what you would think, uh, in lieu of that study that said that it wouldn't bring in more taxing, uh, Tax income, I was wondering how you think CBO would score something like this, especially tying it into R&D and production. <coughs> I mean, we, we didn't try to estimate the cost of this. Um, CBO tends to score everything at the sort of most expensive level they can get. Um, being a little facetious, but uh, you know, I'll give you an example. We, uh, we did a model, and I think maybe on the back table, but it's on our website, on, on uh, the R&D credit and jobs and what would happen. So if, in our model, if you expanded the research and development credit from 14% under the ASC to 20%, uh, and our model, it actually pays for itself. It takes a while, but it does end up with net present value positive revenues to the government. It takes about 14 years to get there. So if we had a 14-year time horizon on our budgeting, uh, you would want to expand the research and experimentation tax credit. We don't have that, so we want to not expand or even cut it. Uh, and I think on a that you, you, to do this model right, frankly, is you have to get into dynamic scoring. And when they don't want to do dynamic scoring, I understand because it's complicated and everybody wants to pretend that their thing is dynamic and no one else's is. I actually do think this is dynamic. I do think that you end up, I mean, evidence is pretty clear, more R&D, more production, more knowledge does lead to higher productivity, it leads to higher incomes, leads to more tax revenues. So my guess is that CBO would score this as, as a hit. But, you know, I have to say, at, at the end of the day, we're going to have to simply bite the bullet in this country and say we're going to get less revenues from the corporate tax system because it's, we can't keep doing what we're doing which is to have an uncompetitive corporate tax system. So you just got to acknowledge that and then maybe talk about some other things. I mean, we had a sort of grand bargain recently where we'd have a carbon tax and use that as a way to fund a lot of these corporate tax incentives. But, you know, whatever that is, uh, I'd raise, I would eliminate the dividend tax reduction for individuals, personally. I don't think that really got us anything. In fact, it's probably negative. Uh, but, you know, lots of different ideas out there to raise other revenues. And I think ultimately we're going to have to reduce them here. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the point you raised, Rob, earlier about the where the R&D credit is saying, okay, help you take risk because you get the credit in the year you, get the ex you take the expense, right? This is really about capturing the commercial aspects of R&D. And so the biggest benefit of doing something like this comes with the fact that once one patent is in the patent box, you start to have income and the companies have income to actually generate more patents to go into the patent box. And so you're retaining the R&D in the country and the reinvestment in the country through the patent box, right? So often when companies utilize this type of um, regime when they're, when they're looking at where to put new R&D, what that what happens is it's potentially a new drug that's coming out on the market that's in the patent box, but they get one in there and the income that they got from the patent box actually generates the next generation and the next generation after that. And so it is also a reinvestment, capturing the reinvestment and the capital associated with it back into the system, which is something we didn't touch on a lot, but that actually is what happens. Uh, again, I'm going to go in order I saw him, so uh, Brett Patrick, yeah. Hi. Uh, Victor, um, I'm Patrick Wilson with the Semiconductor Industry Association, um, the chip makers. And um, my question is really for you, Victor, in the politics leading up to the adoption of a patent box in Poland, um, was there an explicit <coughs> political debate about keeping technology companies because they were more value-added or more attractive? I'm wondering if you could give us some insight into that in the politics. Absolutely. Um, um, it's well. There, there has been several uh, debates, um, and my uh, minister of finance, who used to be the the state secretary for um, for taxation, he he's um, um, he had his own IT company. Um, so he he owned a, a company with web technology and e-commerce, and he had two hundred fifty people working for him. And so he, when he came into office, it was. 
clear that he was passionate about innovation and driving um, technology and getting uh, this this um, done. So when we came to the situation, we had a, a broad discussion. The first discussion we had on the patent box was where we said, okay, we want to do this. That was a, on, and where we introduced a, a fairly narrow patent box that after two years we found out didn't work as well as we hoped. Then the second round of debate came specifically and he, he sort of push the debate into well we think if if, if we as a as a as a, a country want to remain uh, globally competitive we need high tech we need the r and d we need the uh, knowledge based companies uh, so we could we could have gone two ways there we could have sort of okay we did the experiment um, it didn't work out as well so we just uh, abolish it and he went the other way and pushed very hard for broadening of the definition and getting more um, getting more uh, R&D um, within the, the box, lowering the rate even more and getting more attractive to, to make it work. So yes, there was a extensive policy debate and is it really fair to <coughs> get some uh, companies uh, even more tax break, breaks, especially in times where um, uh, in the income tax, um, in the income side, uh, people really uh, have to take the cuts and are in a, I mean, these are not very uh, happy economic times. Um, so it, it, it was a, uh, it was a really a political push to get this, uh, this, this forward. And I think the, um, uh, the political parties behind the government right now, they were in a discussion on this on an, they, they introduced innovation platforms and they want to have innovation policy as a as a um, as a broader uh, topic so it's, it's been a huge issue and um, but it's also personal uh, politics where he pushed it forward yes and I think also on that is the it's always it's been in addition to our some type of R&D credit yeah expansion as well yes ma'am um, Victor you were talking about as uh, well I'm Rachel Bishop, American Chemical Society, sorry. Uh, you were talking about in the process of, of implementing the, the, the patent box uh, approach that you, uh, the government removed some of the specific uh, credits in favor of, of greater generalization so that there was an across the board approach. And then Rob, you were just mentioning a minute ago that uh, you thought maybe we needed to get used to the idea of uh, less uh, less revenue from corporations. Uh, one of the points that I'm wondering about is how the two of you feel that the corporate loopholes that are currently in place uh, need to be addressed in light of the larger issues. Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting because I think um, so there's a report that we wrote, which may be on the table or not, a, a corporate tax reform um, I think it was called Rational Debate or something else. Uh, I can't remember the title, but it was, uh, if you look at what the biggest tax expenditures are on the corporate side, uh, they're not really the, you know, the egregious loopholes that people think they are, like the New York Times likes to write about, oftentimes, sometimes inaccurately. Uh, they're really the R&D credit, accelerated depreciation, and the domestic production deduction and then the low-income housing tax credit. Low-income housing tax credit is not, I mean, it sort of goes to the corporate side. It's just a way of building low-income housing using the tax code. So if you want to get rid of that, we don't do housing. I have no opinion on that. that that's just a different thing. But the, really, the three big ones, if you want to get real rate reduction, you go, you've got to go after these three big ones. These are three big ones are, in our view, really very, very effective, very important. So the domestic production deduction, 85% of that, goes to traded firms, it goes to manufacturers. This was all put in place back in 90, in 2004 when uh, the foreign sales credit, was that what it's called? Yeah. Which we couldn't do because, the, <coughs> no offense to these European countries, they all have border adjustable VATs. Uh, just, that's the way it worked out. We couldn't do that, so we put in place foreign sales corporation and that, and then, then the WTA says, well, we can't do that, <coughs> but you can do your VAT. Uh, the domestic production deduction was a way to get around that. And it's, I don't mean it in a bad way, it was, it's a good way. So if we get rid of that, <clears throat> the end result would be that we would be raising taxes on U.S. manufacturers and technology companies. End of story. Um, 
I don't know why we would want to do that. So <clears throat> there, there are certainly little things. Uh, I mean, the one that we don't like um, uh, are some of the oil and gas subsidies. Um, it, it's sort of like when we were trying to get tobacco people not to smoke and we were subsidizing tobacco production. It's kind of like we're trying to get people not to uh, consume fossil fuels and we're subsidizing them. So there's, you know, there's some things like that that's sort of completely irrational. But I don't think they're super big. Uh, I really do think at the end of the day, if we want to get corporate tax reform, we're just going to have to bite the bullet and say we're going to get less revenue out of it. And at the same time, uh, get more of these kinds of incentives that are generalized. I mean, I, it was funny. I was, I was debating somebody recently on MSNBC or one of these shows, and uh, he actually he actually it was amazing to me. He, he had the, uh, I, I guess, the intellectual audacity to call the R&D tax credit industrial policy picking winners. Uh, and it's picking winners because you're saying that this generic function of research is important, uh, and that's called picking winners. So, I mean, if that's what the debate has come to, that we can't even have g very broad, general kinds of policies that help firms in many, many industries and many kinds of uh, functions around innovation, then I think, you know, we've lost the battle right there. I don't know if yeah. you want I, I mean, I think that where we are, <laughs> in tax reform is we really do need to decide what we want to encourage. We can't fund everything. The rate really does need to come down when when you look at our rate compared to the rest of the world. It it's just not where it needs to be and we get that feedback every day from corporations. And how we get there is going to depend on what we want to encourage and what we can fund after the rate comes down. And I really think that that's what the reality of the situation is. Uh, again, I'm going to order. So Dan, and here, and then here. So a question, I think, mostly for Victor, but the... Uh, Do you want to identify yourself? I'm sorry, Dan Kostenbauer with uh, Euler Packard. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things you mentioned was the, the Netherlands economy is like 60% of the, I guess, the revenue is from sales outside of the Netherlands. Is that... The GDP, GDP? Price, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, that's a that's a much bigger number. I'm not quite sure what the U.S. number is, but it's it's clearly much much bigger. And I think that affects. Uh, my question is is to, to what degree does that affect the, the politics of this in, in several respects? So, I mean, how do the individual taxpayers look at you know, perhaps corporate taxpayers getting better rates? How do some companies that are not, let's say, in the innovation economy, look at those that are in the innovation economy? Do they say? If they're doing well, it's good for us. Or do they say we should, you know, we should get a lower rate too? And then also, how partisan is it? I mean, do, is there a broad consensus among the, you know, sort of the left and the right parties that this is good policy, or is it, uh, you know, if you get a change of government, is this likely to be uh, something that's put onto the, 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 uh, you know, into the, the the mix maybe to be changed? So sort of think about individuals, other companies, and you know, the partisan aspect of it. No, I think once once the policies are in place, it's as as it is here, very hard to get them out again. So that's um, uh, so now we, as we have it now, I think it will will remain there. And there's a, there is a consensus, obviously, that there is um, that as as we we make most of our money outside our own country, there's a <clears throat> there's a consciousness that that I think more than than for instance in the U.S. that we have to look to our neighbors. I mean, it's not. That, that there's seven, seven, seven out of eight countries are doing this in the EU, and um, we obviously watch them closely. Uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, Spain, uh, the UK. Obviously, they're all um, uh, having a, 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 their different tax systems that that it, to a, to some extent uh, compete. So you have to watch them as you. Um, as, as you get a lot of money outside of your own country and you don't have that large of a domestic market. So that's that plays into the uh, politics. Um, but it still is, especially in, in times like this, um, hard to sell, to give uh, companies a, a break when um, when um, uh, families are getting less in their in their uh, paycheck. So that you see that back in the debate. Um, but I think there's a, a but the, and the system in the Netherlands works as such that 
that once a, a government gets into action, they sort of it's a multi-party system, so they have to agree, agree up front with each other. Uh, okay, what are we going to do for the coming uh, three or four years? Uh, four years, um, and they will uh, lay out an, uh, the, the broad ideas. And if it includes uh, a tax reform, then it's it's very likely that it will get will get done, or it will gets on the, on the way and so then you have the, the support in your um, in in the parliaments um, uh, as well but it's a it's a, a, a tough thing I, I don't think we could have done a, a big tax reform and introducing the innovation box now as we did it um, in 2007 and 2008 so there's a question uh, uh, from on Twitter from a uh, person who's watching uh, the video and I'll address it to Tracy. You, you address this a little bit, maybe you can just touch on it, which is, um, the question is, how does patent box lower risk? We talked about it in terms of one of the market failures. And you want to just talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, there's two ways, right? So the first is everybody needs to recognize once a, once a product is on the market, um, and there's income being generated for the patent, that's really when you start to get the patent box benefit, right? Because the benefit is on the income. And what happens when um, a product fails, right? There is still risk once a product is on the market, right? And there's risk of commercializing the product and there's risk of manufacturing and getting that all up. And so by helping to give the incentive and the reduction on the income, if it goes on, it gives people the incentive to, to actually take the risk because they're getting more reward on the back end. Great, thank you. Uh, back here, Ken. Ken Jarbo, Athena Alliance. Um, the knock against patent boxes always were that they were essentially degenerated into tax shelters. Um, and so the knock against Ireland, for example, for a long time, it was a little ironic what the EU came up with, was that the, the production requirements, the R&D requirements were pretty loose. It was more of a win than a nod if you did it variation you got the entire um, the entire tax incentive. Um, Rob you didn't talk about the other attempts to try to rein that in and not have the rates to the bottom which is the transfer price uh, issue of moving your patents from one country to another and how you deal with that. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and and it, it seems there might be a trade-off here that if you put in an innovation credit, and I like the idea of an innovation box rather than a patent box, because if you tie it then to a certain percentage of the R&D and then a certain percentage of the, of the production, you minimize that need or that incentive to start shifting it to other lower tax countries. So the trade -off, is there a trade-off here if we can tighten up the transfer pricing rules and give the lower rate at the same time? Would that be a, a political trade-off here that, that might fly as part of tax reform? Tra overall transfer pricing or and as it relates to patent bonds? Specifically as it relates to patent bonds. Okay. I'm going to let Tracy talk about the transfer pricing yeah. part point, but um, look, that is the reason why we recommended in the report that we have some connection, some nexus to R&D and production. Uh, now, you, you can, if you think about it as a continuum, you can have no nexus, and then you get some of the issues you, you alluded to, Ken, or you can have complete nexus, which is sort of really unworkable given global production chains and all that. It just becomes only, you know, a few companies can take it. So something in the middle, I think, gets you the right sort of incentives for adding more production here in the U.S. and more R&D and reducing risk. Uh, without uh, without sort of limiting the, the the incentive to just a few companies. Yeah, I think on the the transfer pricing question, there are some of the criticisms of transfer pricing or the transfer pricing environment right now, or some of the things that um, people are working through, or just the increased scrutiny around it. Obviously, the UTP schedules came out, which was a transparency measure by the IRS just to have um, corporations disclose their highest tax on certain uh, positions. And there's obviously um, just in general just a lot of scrutiny around reserves around transfer pricing and there's court cases coming up around transfer pricing. So 
It's a very um, hot environment in tax right now because of the level of scrutiny. But the reality is, is when you map all of those things I just named against the patent box regime, well, the jobs would be here, the assets would be here, the functions would be here, the risks would be here. So what is the need to transfer price? So in many ways, it, it could be a win-win for corporations and for, you, uh, for um, the tax authorities in the sense of if everything's here, there's less scrutiny, there's less reserves, the disclosure issues, you know, over time go away. So there's a lot of benefits as far as the level of scrutiny on the transfer pricing because the transfer pricing is really just based on what you're performing where and how much risk you're taking where. And if all that's being done here, then it, you know, it solves the issue. Great, thank you. I think, uh, yes, right here, ma'am. Hi, Sitar Sandy from Pharma. Uh, Tracy, you mentioned that the income generated from the first patent would spur investment in R&D for subsequent patents. Is that reasoning to allow uh, all active patents to qualify for the patent box, or is that too costly and it should be only for new patents? So this is an issue that every regime that's had to work through the patent box has had to work through, right? Like, what do you, where do you draw the line? What patents qualify at what date? It's particularly an issue for life science companies who I deal with because they have a 10-year life cycle. So if you're going to say, okay, we implement the patent box today, every patent that you make after tomorrow starts to qualify. They've got 10 years before they ever see a dollar of benefit, right? So that regime isn't going to be very attractive to them at all, right? Or do you start to say anything that hasn't been commercialized will let you start to take benefit on it because we want to accelerate the amount of reinvestment that comes into the country based on that. And so there is always this trade-off in timing most of the regimes have chosen to um, say if it's not commercialized at the time the patent box is implemented, we'll let you put it in and start to take some type of benefit on it so we can start to get the acceleration of the reinvestment. And that's true in the UK. There's a whole um, discussion in the consultation box about this particular issue and why they chose to take not commercialized and phase in the benefit versus taking a harder line on it needs to be patented, you know, day one after the start. Great. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, great. Um, so let me ask uh, Victor or Tracy if you have any last comments you wanted to make before we wrap up. Okay. Uh, well, good. Well, I hope, um, I hope this... Uh, uh, one uh, lady here said that this was the first time she heard of patent boxes, and I think that's probably the case for a lot of people in Washington. Uh, even though this has been this very dynamic and important development, I think a lot of people in Washington and the U.S. haven't really heard about it. So uh, what I all want you to do is go home and or go back to your office and tweet about patent boxes, <laughs> and we'll get a viral movement going. Uh, but anyways, uh, please join me in thanking uh, two great panelists, and thank you all for coming.